Um, and then to move on, I think in the last few years, really the genetics has continued to uh, follow its rapid rate of progress. Uh, about five or six years ago, PTPN11 was uh, found to be the most common genetic lesion in JMML. Um, and again, interestingly enough, by virtue of its involvement in a genetic syndrome, in this case, Noonan syndrome, which was maybe the second on the list for a genetic association with myeloproliferative disorders, uh, including JMML or JMML-like diseases. And sure enough, the genes that cause Noonan syndrome, uh, or the, the prominent, most prominent gene in Noonan syndrome is actually uh, mutated in JMML as well. And then finally, very recently, um, mutations in Sybil have been reported as now, I guess, the uh, fifth gene. Uh, and we can now account for most, but not all, cases of JMML by ascribing them to one of these signaling proteins. So as I said, most of the advances have been in, in genetics, but what have we really learned about how these proteins are acting and what these mutations mean? Uh, I have to say I'm quite impressed that having one nucleotide error out of a genome of six billion, if you count both halves, is enough to kill you, right? One cell, one base pair is wrong, and your survival is one to two years after that. Um, so there's clearly something very profound about what these mutations are doing to affect the biology of hematopoietic cells. And I think we um, have a long way to go before we can say we fully understand it. So this is a pretty typical cartoon of signal transduction. It's missing a few parts, but I, I put this up here because as I was going through the history, I found this review article from 1997, which in science terms is ages and ages ago. And this looks shockingly familiar because I put up cartoons that look just like this in my talks um, all the time. And I don't mean to say that we're making no progress. I just mean to say that this is a complicated system. And we've added a few new players here. And these are, this is a big deal. I don't want to minimize this. The addition of SHIP2, which is the PTPN11 product, also Sybil, and PA3 kinase was uh, left off this slide as well. But I think the challenge now is to figure out now that we know what the major players are, and we know what some of the intrinsic biochemical abnormalities are, because we know that the RAS mutations activate RAS signaling, we know that the NF mutations result in loss of the NF1 protein, understanding the implications for, of these functions for the whole cell, and how this is actually directing neoplasia, I think is our real challenge. So to end my introduction, to set up some of what, some of what the major questions are, in my opinion, um, one is that we've got um, four or five genes that can be mutated in JMML. Is RAS really the key here, as was initially suspected by the association of NF1 and RAS signaling? Um, and to what extent is signaling through RAS really the central problem uh, for all of these? Um, because another point, if I could just go back to the cartoon for a minute, is that one thing that's interesting about where all these proteins are, they're, they're at a very specific part of this cartoon. They're all downstream of the growth factor receptors and upstream of RAS or at RAS itself, um, which lends you to believe that these proteins can be modulating responses to various growth factors because any receptor potentially could be interacting with these proteins and also a wide variety of downstream cascades because they are all acting upstream of hundreds of cytoplasmic proteins. And it may be that that diversity of function is key to uh, their potency as JMML oncogenes. So one question is the importance of RAS and how Biochemically, these might be ordered. Um, is one protein upstream or downstream of another one, and do they interact in complexes? What is the role of upstream activators? Are receptors important in this disease? Well, we know GMCSF plays a role, at least in some cell types, but probably not in stem cells. And how many different upstream pathways are involved in the pathogenesis of JMML? Likewise, we can go just one step downstream and ask, what is really the output of this that matters, and how is that working? Uh, we'll hear from uh, Becky Chan later about what some of the downstream effects of hyperactive RAS signaling might do and what that might mean for JMML cells. Um, finally, the cell biology is still, um, still needs some work. I think we know that uh, stem cells are probably responsible for the maintenance of this disease, but stem cell doesn't necessarily make you sick. And so the, the extent to which progenitor and mature cells are actually causing the symptoms of JMML remains to be elucidated, elucidated. And hopefully with a study of real biochemistry and understanding the impact of these proteins for the whole signaling network and survival network in the cells, we might be able to understand how to manipulate biochemistry with a pharmacologic compound 
so that the right cells die at the right time if we can uncover specific support signals that these cells need more than any others. Um, so with that is an introduction. Um, we'd like to start the actual program. Um, we're going to first hear from Hamid Band about Sybil, a protein that he's been studying for a very long time. And um, his long experience with this will help us understand, I think, a, uh, what's a new protein for us, but what is an old protein for biology um, and for immunologists. Uh, we'll hear more about uh, Sybil again from uh, Dr. Ogawa, and then move into other aspects of signaling uh, both upstream and downstream in the latter half of the session. Um, so thank you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Band. <laughs> 